after a treacherous voyage that lasted 45 hours, the family finally arrived at a Greek island in the sea called Milos, miles off course. The police detained them for four days upon their arrival. They were cautioned to stay out of Athens as well as three other Greek cities, leaving them stranded. Jaihan took her two sons to La Labion, an informal settlement about an hour's drive from the Greek capital. We came here for a better life and to find people who might better understand our situation, she says. I'm so upset when I see how little they do understand. And this is Amin and his wife, Yasmin, and they're from um, Aleppo, Syria, and they are 82 and 67 years old. So Amin and his wife, Yasmin, fled their home in August of 2012 after their 70-year-old neighbor and his son were brutally killed. Amin was shocked to hear that nearby farms started to become under attack and that homes were being set on fire. He explains that the day they crossed the border, 19 people from their village were brutally killed. He says that he misses his farm and the olive trees the most, but that the most important thing he was able to take with him was when he fled was his wife. Um, this is Mo Muhammad and Minera, and they're from Manyama. Um, they lived in the city capital of Rakhine State until June 2012 when riots erupted between the majority Rakhine Buddhist population and local Rohingya residents. They reached Malaysia. Mohammed found work laboring in paddy fields for a salary of $150 a month, but the police regularly stopped him and confiscated his money. They decided to sell what was left of Minera's wedding jewelry to pay a smuggler to take them to Australia, but the boat broke down after two days, and they floated at sea for another three before hitting a deserted island. Indonesian authorities came and rescued them, but held them in detention at Jakarta for the next year. The, Ra the Rakhine people set fire to all the Rohingya houses, and the military were shooting at us, recalled Muhammad. I took my wife and Hi everyone, uh, so I'm going to briefly talk about uh, where everyone's escaping. Uh, the three main I mean, the three main places are Lebanon, Turkey, and Syria, but we're going to highlight you know, uh, other ones. So it's Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Eritrea, Nigeria, Somalia, Sudan. <laughs> So there are 464,000 migrants crossed into European Europe by sea, uh, usually it's the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so this was during the first nine months of 2015. And there are more than 750,000 expected to arrive by sea by the end of this year. Uh, so since 2011, the numbers of refugees have globally grown, grown by 40%, and 57% of all refugees are children. They're mainly under the age of 18. So, as I said, Turkey and Lebanon and Syria are the main um, receiving countries. So, in uh, Turkey, 1.9 million, I mean, I'm sorry, 1.9 refugees from Turkey. Uh, there's 1.1 million from Lebanon, and from Syria, there's 3.9 million. So, why they're escaping, there are several reasons, but we highlighted some of the main ones. So 3.9 million people have fled from Syria because of a four and a half year civil war. Um, Afghans are escaping war with Taliban rebels, and Eritreans fleeing are, are fleeing for forced labor. Uh, so Iraq, Nigeria, Pakistan, Somalia, and Sudan are escaping because of poverty and uh, deteriorating security. And in Libya, the fall of the Murmur Gaddafi left the country divided, leading into increased violence. Um, the first force that I'm going to talk about is the Islamic State, um, also known as ISIL Daesh, or most commonly ISIS. Um, they're a military organization in Syria and Iraq whose goal is the establishment of an expansion of a caliphate. They grew out of Al Qaeda and grew during the Sir Syrian civil war, waging a campaign of terror against Syria and Iraq. They have gained approximately two billion in assets through invasions, foreign donors, and criminal activities. They manage humanitarian aid in areas under its control and often control vital basics such as food, water treatment, and power plants. This leaves about 12.2 million Syrians in need of humanitarian assistance and 1.1 million Syrians forced to flee their homes. 
that education, health, and social welfare systems are in a state of the collapse as a result. Um, another force is the Kurds. The Kurds are the fourth largest ethnic group in the Middle East, but they do not have a permanent state. In 2013, ISIS attacked the three Kurdish communities bordering the territory in northern Syria, and they began to join the fight as well. Since then, they have undergone many battles with ISIS, and since the Syrian civil war, the Syrian government has abandoned Kurdish populated areas, leaving them to fight against crisis on their own. Um, the Assad government forces include the Syrian army, and they were the first to fire shots in the Syrian conflict in 2011. They have been fighting the Syrian rebels in the Islamic State ever since. Uh, with Russia, China, Iran, and Hezbollah as its biggest allies, they provide military weapons, financial support, and guerrilla warfare training. The Syrian army has committed war crimes, including the murder and torture of civilians, and what appears to be a state-directed policy, as reported by the UN. The most infamous violation of human rights by the Syrian government was in 2013 when the government launched chemical weapons against its own civilians. By 2015, however, the Syrian military appears on the verge of collapse due to a declining loss of manpower, declining support for the government, and a failing Syrian economy after years of war and fighting. The last political force involved are the anti-government forces. Due to harsh government oppression, opposition forces took up arms to defend from them and expel security forces, leading to a descent into civil war. These rebel groups range from moderate to extremist and include the Free Syrian Army, who have tried to consolidate Syrian rebel factions under one unified movement. So today there's four major um, players. There's the government, the anti-government forces, the Kurds, and ISIS who are all fighting and the civilians are caught completely in between and that's why they're attempting to flee. Uh, government security forces opened fire on a peaceful protest which caused civil unrest to skyrocket. Opposition to the government began to form rebel groups eventually taking arms. As these rebels began to engage in battle with the local government, other groups began taking advantage of the weak conditions in Syria. Uh, the Islamic State has taken to the Syrian street massacring those who refuse to accept their rule. There is also Hezbollah and Kurdish presence um, all fighting for territory control. What started as a civil outcry is now um, being played out through secular undertones. To the day, over 250,000 lives have been lost in relation to the Syrian conflict, while four out of five Syrians now live in poverty. The company's infrastructure is also um, in shambles. What can be done? The answer to this question is much deeper than most political questions. There is moral conflict at the root of this discussion, and the solution isn't clear. Individuals within the country of unfit conditions simply are leaving for safe haven while other countries' responses to these migrants have been mixed. While morally it seems human nature to want to help these who are fleeing home due to war-torn conditions, countries are concerned for their citizens' safety. An influx of migrants presents a greater risk of territory activity as ISIS policy activity of migrants plan to, to plan their entry into countries if they plan to attack. Um, it, is right, it is not right to bar all interference in an attempt to reduce terrorism and leave, <clears throat> leave those people with no homeland to die. Um, that is the question you must decide when looking at this situation. In order to reduce uh, migrant activity, the countries from which individuals are fleeing from, uh, violence is being the main reason for those fleeing, so how do we limit the bloodshed? If we are to leave the country to sort out their own problems, it may take dec decades to see peace restored. If we were to interfere, we risk American casualties and make uprooted countries' way of life, paving away from more violence. Uh, a clear solution has proven elusive. As I said, many flee from um, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so that's the most popular and most dangerous route, and it's commonly used route by Syrians. Uh, from Turkey to Greek, uh, islands of Kos, Chios, Lesbos, and Samos is rubber dinges of wooden boats. And uh, the voyage from Libya to Italy is more dangerous and hazardous. Overland with caravans, pickup trucks, walking, trains, smugglers. Um, so the routes include Eastern European borders, Albania to Greece and West, and Balkan route. And as I said, the Mediterranean Sea is most commonly used. Um, so a total of th uh, 3,400 migrants have died trying to make the crossing to the Mediterranean Sea. And just two words on uh, the humanitarian response that you have tried to give to this uh, catastrophe of humanity. There are three operations that have been uh, succeeding, I mean, uh, coming up in time. Mare Nostrum operation, Triton, and Sofia. What is the difference between these operations? 
The very first operation, first of all, was uh, funded only by the Italian government that with an expenses of 9.5 million euros a month has been able to save 150,000 people. It was mainly uh, an operation of uh, rescuing people in ICs, wherever they were. And you can see the distance at which the, they could intervene, 175 um, sea miles. And then it has been followed by an operation that is being funded by European Union but uh, notwithstanding the fact that it is a much larger coalition of states, the funding has been uh, cut drastically, and it's just 2.9 million, and they have reduced the, the distance at which they can operate, and this is a patrolling operation, so it's not rescuing, it's sending them back from where they're coming. So it's basically fetching the, the ships wherever they are and trying to send them back from where they're coming from. This has been picked up heavily within the media, obviously, um, after the Paris attacks as well, with um, ISIS uh, being so prevalent in today's media. There's a very big um, discussion whether or not to open borders, and clearly the media has a very negative reaction to this, um, which is also interesting because if you look to the bottom left of this slide, you can see um, it's kind of dark, so you can't really tell, but uh, this graph basically is saying um, the per, uh, this percentage of um, refugees that are actually coming into the country based off of what people think <coughs> is being allowed. Um, so Italy, it's off by 23%. Um, there's only about 7% of the population that is refugees, but they believe that it's 30% of the population that is refugees. So it's very interesting to see um, the way that media <coughs> is able to influence people in this negative way to think that this population is like heavily influenced by refugees, but it's not the case. Oops, sorry. And what's very um, saddening to see is that because the media portrays these refugees in such a, a negative way that the countries don't want to open their borders and let these refugees in, it's taking the humanity out of the issue. Uh, these people are struggling to to seek refuge. Their, um, their countries are being bombed and they're, they're not living in healthy environments and they just want to escape that. Uh, and the media is not really covering their struggles, they're just saying that they don't want to be responsible for uh, helping, which is really taking humanity out of the issue. Um, so these are just some images that kind of portray the reality of what's going on uh, with refugees. He is now in Horgos, Serbia, and Hungary's borders closed, she sees, in a forest with other refugees. Emperor um, Abdul Karam, he is um, currently in Athens, Greece, and he spends the nights in Omna Square where hundreds of refugees are arriving every day. And Jaihan is in Greece. Her two sons are in Lavrion, an informal settlement about an hour's drive from the Greek capital. Emperor Amun and his wife, um, Yasmin, they crossed the border and escaped, but however, their current location was um, not disclosed. Um, Muhammad and Minera were granted refugee status and moved into the Ioan accommodation in Makassar. Now they spend their days waiting for the UNHCR to come with good news, which is resettlement to a country where refugees are not denied the right to work. What we may be discussing together in class it is the crisis that symbols and symbol, symbolism uh, I mean, has been uh, undergoing. And that uh, symbols uh, in the visual arts, but in today's society, in particular, have been replaced by logos. So we have lost the capacity of synthesizing like deep uh, thoughts in, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, and a bidimensional uh, um, uh, imagery. Um, we have lost the capacity of uh, like uh, unfolding the meanings. And again, as I told you today, it is uh, um, very often to um, misunderstand logos for actual symbols, while like re uh, uh, gaining 
a knowledge of the symbol or the use of the symbol. It's like getting to know what is around us from the very core. So I told them, get the fruit, try to open the fruit, eat it, taste it, uh, cook with it, smash it, and try to understand why at the beginning that uh, the, the fruit, the home it, has certain meanings and how that meanings can be revamped today. How uh, the meaning in particular the home it, but in general, symbol it, can be revamped today as a sort of practice. And this is what they did. The pomegranate is exemplary of the significance and the influence nature has on us and serves as a symbol which stems from the womb of the Mediterranean. From classical and biblical times <coughs> till present day, certain plants have been used to express beauty, love, passion, and appearance. However, certain fruits, more than others, appear in historical accounts. The association of the unity of many into one through the pomegranate has been well established through the Mediterranean basin as early as the Iron Age. The fruit appears in numerous texts and artifacts from the Bronze Age dating to classical times. Often, it was used as a decorative motive or as an object placed in a tomb, which would suggest that in the Asian culture, at least, the pomegranate played a significant role in the transition into the afterlife. However, iconography of the pomegranate shows that it was uh, that it was used for the elite rather than the lower statuses, but uh, that's probably due to the fact that it was considered an exotic fruit at the time and uh, was not made readily available to the general public. Being that Demeter, the mother of Persephone, falls into deep mourning for her daughter after having been captured by Hades, god of the underworld. She becomes furious and filled with sadness. And her morning halts harvest on all the land and casts cold temperatures and stops growth of vegetation while her daughter was missing. The pomegranate appears in the myth as not only the fruit of life, but also as the fruit of the underworld. The sweet fruit was presented to Persephone by Hades as a trick to persuade her to stay by his side, and she indulges in six pomegranate seeds, each representative of the cold months of the year where most of, Earth, most of Earth's fertility is masked by temperatures unconducive to growth and vegetation. As a result of his trick on the helpless bride, as well as a part of the compromise made by Zeus with Hades, it was made so that Persephone would spend six months by his side as goddess of the underworld. The reason for the change of the season then came into being. Demeter was furiated by this decision, of course, and during Persephone's absent months would continue to halt harvest until her return. The pomegranate is not only divine in literary and artistic symbolism, but also in numbers. Dissecting the anatomy of the pomegranate is essential in understanding the natural occurrences that are considerably divided. The 613 seeds of the fruit represent a, a deeper significance in nature. By reducing the digits of each number and adding them together, we come to a core number of one. This number, the number of creation, is the primal source or force from which all other numbers spring forth. It is the womb of infinity and the finite the source of which all life, all death, and everything in between comes into existence. Nature's most basic building block is the number one. The element knows no mercy and its cruelty can be heartbreaking. However, it knows balance and gives life indiscriminately and without judgment. We compete with nature. We alter Mother Nature's creations for our consumption. And we understand and act and face consequence. We discriminate against cultures and countries and expect no repercussion. An understanding of nature teaches us that this is never a good idea, and almost always produces unexpected backlashes. The number one has a similar built-in perfection and balance. You can change a forest here or there, but negative repercussions are likely. It's possible to see the evolution of man in nature. Some scholars believe that the tree of knowledge in the garden is in what effect a pomegranate, and this would perhaps suggest that the origin of life, and even decay, would stem from the seeds of the pomegranate. Initially, the earth was all wild, and humans worked with nature in order to provide for their needs. However, with the introduction of agriculture, people started to force nature into something that it was not, just so that it could take on the qualities that they desired. As with the pomegranate, the cultivation of the pomegranate, it was only done for aesthetic purposes. And as such, human beings were imposing their own ideas of self onto the nature introducing their own concept of culture. 
And that is the starting point of the separation between man and nature, the difference between culture and nature. Human beings are walking further and further away from their natural roots, meaning people are destroying nature in order to create something of their own. And they're manipulating the natural world in their search for a perfect world and their paradise. Yet in the search, they're also killing their own kind. The pomegranate's relation to modern warfare, modern warfare may not seem as apparent, but consider this. There's a certain irony in the fact that the Mediterranean is united by this one fruit, which is also the symbol for unity. Yet at the same time, they're always at war with each other. <clears throat> as the war spread throughout the Mediterranean, so did the pomegranate. While the pomegranate is common in all, in all of the regions of the Mediterranean today, it was not so. Historical records show that it originated in Turkey and Iran, and later through war conquest, it was transported with the elite as they moved from place to place. So perhaps it is no coincidence that the fruit also became an image for a weapon. The pomegranate looks exactly like a grenade, like a hand grenade. And if you open up the grenade, you will see tiny balls of shrapnel inside, just like the seeds of the pomegranate. And if the seeds of the pomegranate are also a symbol for life, the shrapnels can act as a symbol for a new hit target. And it is very ironic that the fact that the grenade is based on an image of a symbol that symbolizes fertility and unity it is also used as a symbol for death. It takes on the seeds and gives life to new plants. In Christianity, the pomegranate is also the, uh, the symbol of the blood of Christ. Oftentimes in paintings, Jesus is depicted holding the fruit as a way of communicating that uh, through his sacrifice, the people were able to have a spiritual spring or rebirth. Yet, ironically, this is all coming from a place of death. It is the cycle of life, the cycle of nature. Through death, inevitably, there comes life. And through war, inevitably, there comes new political order and new revolution. It can also be easily transformed into destruction and the source of death. We are from nature, and so we need to return our energy that we have from hate into peace and understanding. We share this land, and so we should also share our differences. We must be able to learn from our mistakes, and the memory of the abuses of power must be transformed into the creation of knowledge and immunity against extremism. of them are not here. You see the group was formed of seven students which worked on this project after that I warmly recommended them, <laughs> which is an euphemism of course. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm very happy that uh, this uh, last panel comes just in this moment after that you talked about Tom Grenade, which is actually also a symbol of the church, as you said, of Jesus and of the church, so of unity and of sacrifice. And uh, after the panel that comes before Lucia and uh, Valentina and uh, about the migration. As a matter of fact, you can see in the title of, of our, of our uh, final discussion that we were starting from the concept of migrating too, of course. This is a topic which is so hot at this moment, so important, so interesting, so deep which we were actually uh, tempted to start and to talk about that. But when we were, the students were starting to, to research and uh, I saw that we were too much focusing on us at that aspect. So it was, uh, uh, it was also covering other aspects that other had already done, but at the same time it was, uh, uh, in my opinion, which might be wrong of course, uh, uh, being connected with the classic history of Christianity, I thought that we should have said something a little bit different. The, the difference that we wanted to add was uh, what I just said now, an idea of hope. <laughs> so we were trying <laughs> to focus not so much on conflict, <laughs> but a little bit more on the possibility, <laughs> if exists, if it's possible, on the possibility of living together in a, a deeper way, so in a different way. And that's how they were coming out, and uh, that's their work, so I leave them the word. 
So first, what is euphemism? Um, it can be defined as promoting or tending towards worldwide Christian unity or cooperation. The idea of euphemism um, initiated with the Catholic Church, and it was the idea of literally promoting unity between like Catholicism, um, the Protestant religion, Orthodox, and just uniting all the churches. Because um, when following Jesus, it's like he instituted the wonderful sacrament of the Eucharist, by which unity of his church is both signified and made a reality. Um, there's one body and one spirit for all of you who have been baptized, and if everyone is a follower of Jesus, why can't the church be one? Why can't everything like follow one another and um, combine? So this um, euphemism, it promotes justice, it promotes truth, and understanding what it is in the Catholic faith can help us understand what it is and how we can apply it to other religions and how we can apply it to today. Um, so a lot of this presentation is going to touch on historical events that promoted euphemism and shows how like unity and um, tolerance combined changed society in migrating faiths. Um, it was hard to find a lot of examples, but um, we did by tracing migrating faiths um, to different lands, customs, and ideas elsewhere. So. For me, it wasn't hard finding many situations. <laughs> Here's there, I love the story, history. And there's many situations where you can relate ecumenism to historical events. I love history. And I just decided this week that I want to be a professor. <laughs> I, told the, I told the teacher that. So, now, I'm going to talk about the first historical example of ecumenism, which is the uh, Reconquista, or Inquisition of Spain. This example is interesting because this is a period of both religious conflict and religious tolerance. There is a delicate balance of religious tolerance in the Christian-controlled Spanish territory in which there were Muslim and Jewish populations that were allowed to practice their faiths in peace. Despite the religious faiths in, in, in peace, this, oh, sorry, sorry, despite the religious tolerances provided at the time, the timeline of the Spanish Reconquista, or Inquisition, from the 8th to 15th centuries, includes many examples of religious conflict as well. In the Middle Ages, the principle of the, of the Augustin, Augustinian just war was introduced. When it was introduced, the Christian Spaniards united themselves together to fight the Islamic Moors, which is an example of both humanism within Christianity by conflict within other religions. As well, overall, the importance of the culture, religious dialogues are clear. As we reflect on the history of ecumenism and religious tolerances versus conflict. It's very, very hard to find examples of religious tolerance when we look through world history and all we focus on is religious conflict. So we're going to jump forward to 1965 at the Second Vatican Council. So this is a very important council for the Catholic religion, and not only does it was it the point when they decided to change masses from Latin to the vernacular language, but there's also a big focus on interfaith dialogue and the relations of the Catholic Church with the modern world and with other religions. So there's a line here, and it's from the Nostra Aetate, which is the declaration of the relation of the Church to non-Christian religions. And so this quote here says, the church examines more closely her relationship to non-Christian religions, her lack of, of promoting unity and love among men, <coughs> and her task of promoting unity and love among men, indeed among nations. She is considered above all in this declaration what men have in common and what draws them to fellowship. So this is a very important turning point in the history of Christianity and in the Catholic tradition in terms of that they recognize that there's truth within other religions, not even not only Hinduism and Buddhism, but also recognizing commonalities with Islam and Judaism. And so this is a very important um, ecumenical effort in terms of, it's a very challenging word to say, it's a very important effort in terms of realizing that, that we have commonality with these other religions and we need to work for interfaith dialogue and going into the future. And so the No Shari Fati document is, is controversial because it says, yes, like we need to recognize our brothers and sisters in other religions, but it, it wasn't fully complete because it still says, they're not as true as us, we're the best. So there, 
it, there's still work to be made, and so we're going to jump forward in the next example to modern day. Jordan is it's a particularly hard country to talk about um, being in the Middle East with all the conflicts with um, Muslims and Christians, but we managed to come up with some positive things to talk about, which is always good. So, um, Foreign Minister Nasser Judeh was quoted as saying, Religious tolerance and interfaith dialogue have always been two fundamental pillars of Jordan. Their constitution guarantees religious freedom to all government recognized religions. Um, recent years, re recent reports of social and religious discrimination towards minority faiths have questioned the present state of religious pluralism in Jordan. However, despite these concerns, many consider the Jordanian government an example of religious tolerance between Muslims and Christians in the Middle East. Um, and religious pluralism can be defined as an attitude or policy regarding the diversity of religious belief systems coexisting in society. Um, now, in Jordan, religious discrimination is prohibited by law, and although this isn't perfect, this is an attempt to keep things civil. Um, now, the royal family has promoted a form of moderate is Islam that aims to challenge commonly held stereotypes of Islam and Muslims worldwide, and many interfaith centers and organiz organizations have been developed within Jordan. Um, three of them are the Jordanian Interfaith Coexistence Research Center, the Royal Institute for Interfaith Studies and Jordan Interfaith Action. Um, and not only are these helpful um, with ecumenism, but they're also um, places for people to feel comfortable. These um, specific organizations promote unity. Um, so Jordan provides an asylum for a large number of refugees from Syria and Iraq. And today the World Council of Churches sees its role as sharing quote, the legacy of one ecumenical movement and the responsibility to keep it alive and acting as a trustee for inner coherence of the movement. And so this map I chose because we are, although we're focused on the Mediterranean here, we do live in a globalized world. So it shows the predominant religion in different countries throughout the world. Um, Red is Christianity, Green is Islam, there's um, uh, Blue is Judaism, which is the state of Israel, and then there's Hinduism and uh, Buddhism as well. So that was why I chose this map in this chapter. So then we're going to conclude with a quote from the Pope to, um, today. Dial dialogue is not negotiation. Negotiation is trying to get their own slice, okay. <laughs> a slice of the common pie. That is not what I mean. But seek the common good for all. Discuss together. Dare I say get angry together. But think the best solutions for all.